I'm David Brooks, and the other guy is Michael Sandell, and we are, I hope we're friends. I think we've known each other for a few years. Uh, we have a mutual friend in Tom Friedman, who you grew up with way back there in Minnesota. Right. Uh, and it's a pleasure to talk about this book 26 years after you wrote it and 26 years after I read it. Uh, and it was a pleasure to read it again in more fraught times, sadly, when it's more needed. So I thought I'd just start off by asking you, um, you know, what's the central argument of the book and, and why did you decide to give us a new version? Well, first of all, thank you, David. It's a privilege to be in conversation with you, as it always is on these topics. Thank you for doing this. The central theme of the book when it was published uh, 26 years ago was, although it was a heady time in the mid-1990s, the Cold War had ended, it seemed that our version of democratic capitalism was the only system left standing. It was a triumphalist time. And yet it seemed that just beneath the surface, it was possible to glimpse a rising discontent with the democratic project for two, uh, for two reasons. First, the project of self-government seemed to be slipping away. People felt it was an inchoate anxiety, perhaps, but people felt that they were, they had less and less of a voice, less of a say in shaping the forces that governed their lives. And second, there was a sense that the moral fabric of community was unraveling. This is a theme, David, that you've taken up with uh, reweaving the social fabric and the work that you've been doing. In the mid 1990s, though we were flush with a with a rising economy and and with the hope that globalization would uh, deliver rising and shared prosperity i think people then sensed and this was a major theme of the book that that the the fabric of community was was receding and uh, yet so fast forward to today what then may have seemed inchoate anxieties beneath the surface of an otherwise heady, even triumphalist moment. Now, has, uh, those anxieties have hardened into uh, polarization, anger, resentment, grievance, so pronounced that they cast a shadow over the future of democracy itself. So that was the reason to, to try to update the book to to really take a look back at the last three or four decades and see if I could make sense of how this unfolded. Yeah, you were more prescient than I was because I was very much stuck in the uh, end of history, liberal triumphalism mode back in the 1990s. I was over in Soviet Union, then in Russia, seeing what I thought was the, the rise of liberal democratic capitalism around the world and the spread of that. Uh, but why don't you, I, I think one story that could be told about these 26 years is that liberalism seemed triumphant because it does offer a lot. It, all, it generally offers freedom and prosperity and individual choice. But there was something about liberalism that was not satisfying personally, that an ethic of community meant that people became too isolated one from another. Yeah. Uh, and second, it didn't uh, offer much solidarity. And right. so the story that could be told is that the last 26 years we've seen the rise of enemies of liberalism, both on the Putinist or Xi Jinping left or, or the Trumpian right. It, yeah. Is that basically the story you would tell? Yes. And in the case of the United States, part of what animated the sense of possibility, the sense of triumph and achievement, was a certain conception of the, uh, of the economy and its relation to freedom. And it seemed that the, that the glories of the market economy uh, unleashed and writ global uh, would put to rest the enmities associated with national borders. And I mean, back then, though, it's almost hard to imagine now, we thought that welcoming China to the WTO and promoting uh, all, all manner of free trade agreements and the free flow of capital across national borders would render national borders 
increasingly obsolete, not only from the standpoint of economic arrangements, but also from the standpoint of identity. The, the difference we were told is no longer between left and right, but between open versus closed, as if to question or, or criticize the, the version of neoliberal globalization that was unfolding was a kind of closed-mindedness um, uh, akin to a kind of bigotry. And, and uh, so it carried with it the idea that cosmopolitan identities would sweep away and make unnecessary and render atavistic old-fashioned things like patriotism and national belonging and obligation. And so I think this, this idea of, of freedom was connected to the erosion of community and also of, of self-government. You make a point in the book of how conversations about economics have changed over the yeah. course of American history. Could you describe that? They seem much richer back in centuries past. Right. I think the reason that they were richer, even though they were no less contentious than today, is there was a tradition that was that coexisted with the tradition of liberal individualism, which has come to the fore in recent decades that I describe in the book as the tradition of civic republicanism. And the civic republican tradition offers a different way of thinking about the economy from the one that's become familiar over the last half century or so. On the civic republican tradition, part of the point of an economy, one of the questions we should ask when debating economic arrangements is what economic arrangements are compatible with self-government, and in particular, with cultivating the virtues among citizens that self-government requires. This goes all the way back to Thomas Jefferson's celebration of the yeoman farmer as independent of judgment and mind, not beholden and dependent on a factory boss, and therefore, uh, more likely to be suited to democratic citizenship, the, the, the ability to deliberate about the common good. And through the 19th century, the political economy of citizenship, as I call it, took different forms as the industrial economy took shape. The early labor movement still drew upon it. The Knights of Labor, one of the, my favorite examples, the most influential labor uh, movement in the late 19th century, uh, one of their demands, apart from wages and, and uh, relief of, of hours and so on, was reading rooms in factories so that workers on their breaks could inform themselves about public affairs and equip themselves to be citizens. It's this tradition, David, of the political economy of citizenship that I think has, has been eroded uh, well, in the 20th century, especially in the late 20th century and into our day. And all we argue about really is the size and distribution of GDP, how to grow the pie, how to distribute the pie. That almost exhausts the terms of political argument over the economy. And I think that represents a loss, a deflation a, 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 from this more demanding civic understanding of what it is to be a citizen. So economics is now just how much can we get rather than what kind of people does is our economic system turning us into. Exactly. And so, you know, I, I think about this a lot because I, the last few years I've been obsessed with two questions. The, the one is, why are we so sad? Yeah. Why is there a rise of mental health, depression, suicide, drug, deaths of despair? And the other is, why are we so mean? Yeah. Uh, why is there so much public meanness? And there are a lot of theories people have promoted, social media is driving us crazy, economic inequality, demographic transition. And I believe in all these theories, but I think my fundamental theory, and I'd love to get your reaction, is that we've stopped doing moral formation, yeah. that the founders really had a pretty skeptical view of human nature. And they thought, well, if these people are going to govern themselves, we're going to need to train them to be a certain sort of citizen. Right. And that was mostly done in churches, synagogues, and mosques, but it was done at universities. It was done that public schools had the courtesy club and the thrift club and the YMCA movement, the Sunday school movement, the settlement house movement. They were all doing forms of moral formation. And then it, and my theory is that it all ended around right after the war 
when people looked at hierarchies and authority and said, that leads to terrible things. We need to D, get rid of these authority structures. And B, people are basically good. And so we shouldn't worry about forming them. We should worry about the way institutions screw up the natural goodness of humankind. And so moral formation just sort of went away. And, and in the universities, and I would say in the way we talk about the economy, does that strike you as a, a plausible thing that's happened and why we, we talk about economics so differently than we used to? Well, I certainly agree, David, that the formative project, as I would call it, that it was central to the civic tradition, going back to the founding, has been attenuated to the point of disappearance almost in our politics, in our public discourse, and in our way of thinking about the economy. Uh, I think that we can see traces of the eclipse of the formative project going back to the early 20th century, but gathering force after the Second World War and in the aftermath of the New Deal. Uh, even antitrust law and anti-monopoly law uh, in the 20th century was conceived at the start, not only or even mainly as a way of lowering, keeping consumer prices low, which is how we think of antitrust today. But it was thought of as a way of enabling the democracy to control the economy and especially the concentration of power in the economy. That was the point of antitrust law, to keep the economy within the reach of citizens. And this was connected to the formative project, because though it's hard to imagine today, the thought was not only does the law cultivate civic virtue, not only do institutions like public schools and Sunday schools cultivate civic virtue, but so does the way we configure the economy. So I would add, I would agree very much that part of the problem is that the formative project has fallen away. I connect this to the emergence in the years after the Second World War, and especially the late 20th century, of a certain version of the liberal tradition, of liberal individualism, that sees the formative project as being at odds with freedom, that wants govern, this is the liberalism of neutrality, of what I call the procedural republic. It's the idea that government, people disagree about conceptions of the good life, people in a pluralist society like ours disagree about the meaning of virtue. So justice and law and government should not be about trying to cultivate any particular conception of virtue or of the good life, but instead should provide a framework of rights that is neutral with respect to those competing moral conceptions. And it's this version of liberalism as neutrality that I've, I've criticized for some time, and that I think is connected to the disempowering effects and also the, the erosion of community of the, uh, of the economy and of the public discourse that we've seen really over the last half century. Let me ask you about uh, your business, which is education. Yeah. So I have a colleague, uh, who you, I'm sure you know, uh, Tony Cronman, who used to be dean yeah. at Yale Law School. And he wrote yes. a third fine book called Education's End. Yes. It's about the transition from what he called the university with the humanistic ideal, which is we form character, we form our students. One of my favorite examples of this was this a headmaster, a place called the Stowe School, which I think is in Vermont. And he said, we try to turn out students who are acceptable at a dance, invaluable at a shipwreck. And I, I like that formulation because that's the kind of person they were trying to form that. And, and Harvard, Yale, and all schools were trying to do that. One of my heroes, Francis Perkins, went to Mount Holyoke, where they were certainly doing, sending young women out to really change the world. Uh, and then Cronman says, we uh, shifted the university over to the humanistic ideal, to the research ideal, that the job of the university is to produce knowledge, not to form. And some people, um, maybe including yourself, say this is, and certainly Cronman, say this is unfortunate. But then 
your Harvard colleague and my third cousin, Steven Pinker, um, I, I saw a comment where he said, you know, I've sat on millions of faculty and hiring committee hearings. We never talk about whether the candidate knows how to form character. We've never been trained in any of that. It should not be our business to do any of this stuff. And so Pinker says, no, that's somebody else's job. <laughs> uh, so how do you think about it? You teach um, students. So how do you think about that? I'm on, in that debate, I'm on Tony Cronman's side, in short. But here's how I would analyze what's happened. I think that universities should have as central to their mission engaging students in moral and civic education and reflection. The ability not only to argue and reason and debate and deliberate as citizens, but also to reflect on what's worth caring about and why. And so I think that moral and civic education should, and moral and political philosophy should be at the heart of a liberal arts education. Part of what's happened over the last 50 or 60 years is that the social sciences, or more precisely, a, in my view, blinkered, allegedly value neutral version of the social sciences, inspired largely by a certain version of doctrinaire economics, has come to have a greater and greater role in education in the curriculum. And that moral and uh, courses in moral and political philosophy, though they continue to exist at, at great many universities, they don't play as central a role, partly because the, the supposedly value neutral social sciences have uh, proliferated and to some degree crowded out moral and civic education. And so I think this is part of the problem uh, that we are equipping young people to be technocrats rather than democratic citizens capable of moral reasoning and argument and deliberation. Uh, so that's part of part of the problem. I think another part of the problem is that, uh, and this is related to meritocracy and the tyranny of merit, uh, a theme of my previous book. I think we have cast universities as sorting machines for a market-driven meritocratic society. Universities are the institutions that define the merit and confer the credentials that a market-driven meritocracy rewards. And this, though it's heightened the prestige and the cultural centrality of universities, it's also deflected us, I think, from our educational mission, from the intrinsic purpose that higher education should serve, from the purpose that makes higher education higher, which is to say, to enable students, to challenge students, to reflect on their moral and political convictions, to figure out what they believe and why. So for these two reasons, I think, higher education is not doing the job that it should be doing at equipping um, young people to, ref to, to learn the art of democratic argument and to engage in moral reflection. Um, and, uh, and and I think it it diminishes the the relation of uh, university education to to soulcraft, which takes us back to the formative project. Yeah, it's it's interesting to, to combine your last two books, or the, this this book and, and the tyranny of merit. Yeah, uh, because you, that you do see one of the reasons democracy is in decline, in my view, is that the top twenty percent educated piece of not only our country but pretty much across the Western world go to the same universities, marry each other, invest yeah. tremendously in their kids. Their kids go to the same universities, marry each other. They move to a few highly rich cities and you get this inherited uh, Brahmin class and the rest of the 80% of these societies says, there's something wrong with that. There's too much power co concentrated in these people. So the, yeah. in a sense, the meritocracy is leading to the democratic decline and the rise of populism. Yes, and I think... Uh, it's no accident that large portions 
of uh, large numbers of working class voters feel that credentialed elites look down on them and don't uh, respect the work that working people do. And uh, this sense of, of grievance, this sense of being looked down upon, um, I think contributed to the backlash against elites that fueled the rise of Trump. And as you say, we see this in many other societies as well. Let me ask you to, as someone who writes a lot about citizenship and the obligations of citizenship, let me ask you just to reflect on the citizenship you've seen in America over the last seven or eight years, the rise of conspiracy theories, the rise of alternative truths. What what, what exactly is going on that that renders people less, um, I don't know if I put it this way, but less successful citizens? I think it has a lot to do with the loss of trust and also with anger and resentment. I would say much of it legitimate against elites. We saw this during COVID. It was interesting. Of course, you know, Dr. Fauci became a political uh, figure and a punching bag for many on the right, even though he was trying earnestly to give his best public health advice about how to contend with COVID. By the time the pandemic arrived, there was deep suspicion uh, and mistrust of elites. And this made governance during a pandemic very difficult and highly politicized. I think the way had been prepared for that mistrust of elites by the failed economic expertise and advice that had brought us the neoliberal finance-driven version of globalization for four decades. I think that, the, because of course, these were the economic experts who assured us that a market triumphalist version of globalization will make everybody better off. They assured us that yes, there will be some dislocation, there will be winners and losers, but the gains to the winners can be used in principle to compensate the losses to the losers. And this assurance by economic experts, many of them in the role of policy advisors, uh, assured us that we should deregulate the financial industry, that we should not regulate derivatives, that it was all that this would reduce systemic risk. Well, it all came crumbling down, the hubris of this advice and its misdirection with the financial crash in 2008. But then the same advisors said, well, instead of reconstructing the economy and diminishing the role of unfettered finance, we should fix it. We should restore it, put it back together again, which sadly is what the bailout did, the Wall Street bailout did. At the time, we were told there is no alternative. That's what the experts tell us. There is no alternative. But I think the people didn't believe that. And the anger and the frustration took two, two forms. On the left, it fueled the Occupy movement and the surprisingly powerful candidacy of Bernie Sanders in 2016. On the right, it fueled the Tea Party movement and ultimately uh, the election of Donald Trump. So I think that the, the way experts and technocrats and the mainstream parties dealt with the financial crisis actually paved the way to the the bitter, polarized, rancorous politics, and the backlash that we are still contending with today. Now, when um, President Biden and Speaker, presumed Speaker Kevin McCarthy, get together and call you and say, okay, you've got problems with how the economy is forming us as a nation, what should we do about it? What answer do you give to them? I would begin by noticing how we have already under the, the Biden administration, maybe not by philosophical design, but we have already departed quite a bit from the doctrinaire 
neoliberal Washington consensus certitudes of the global economy. This is partly because of the pandemic, the faith in supply chains, the seamless uh, frictionless efficiency of global supply chains, the outsourcing and offshoring of jobs to low wage countries, uh, the insistence on trade agreements. Uh, a lot of this has gone by the wayside. Uh, uh, President Biden has not gotten rid of the tariffs for the most part, the tariffs on China. And now there's a lot of discussion of, uh, and, uh, even of industrial policy with the CHIPS Act, which was enacted with bipartisan support. So I be, would begin by pointing out what has already happened, that there is a, an implicit rethinking of the certitudes of that triumphalist moment we were discussing earlier, David. And then I would say, we need to, we need to change the terms of public debate to ask more directly, uh, what, how can we reconfigure the economy in a way that strengthens community rather than contributes to its unraveling, and that enables people through democratic institutions to have a meaningful say in the economic forces that govern our lives. I think these are, were, were the two blind spots of the purely technocratic approach to the global economy over the past four decades. Yeah. When people get down in America, I, I do say we do have a tendency to adjust uh, and we get things wrong. And I do think those adjustments you've mentioned are not quite bipartisan, but a little bipartisan, uh, those movements. And, and I do, I see glimmering signs of some readjustment of our economy. Uh, that might be good for community. The Rahm Emanuel, the former Chicago mayor, who's now our Japan ambassador to Japan, gave a speech last week and he put up two maps. One was how many investments from abroad over a billion dollars are being made in the US and how many over a hundred million. And what was interesting about the maps, you see a little dot for every big investment. They were not spread and not mostly or barely at all on the coasts. They were mostly in the Midwest and the upper Midwest and the, the West. Uh, and they were spread across America in the parts of America we think are um, hollowing out. And so it could be that people are seeing opportunities at places where a decade or two, two ago they might have fled from. Um, well, I hope that's right. And no, uh, I hope no, that continues. I also think we have to reconsider the outsized role that finance has come to play in the economy. Um, finance is important and necessary to a healthy economy when it's doing what finance is supposed to do, which is directing capital to socially useful purposes, like building new factories and companies and homes and roads and hospitals and schools, investing in the real economy. But the explosion of finance as a portion of GDP and as a percentage of corporate profits that we've seen in the last 30, 40 years, most of that uh, increase in finance is not of this productive kind. Most of it is speculative, even extractive forms of uh, financial activity that consists on essentially on, a, on gambling on the future value of already existing assets some of them invented, uh, like derivatives, for the sake of being bet upon. And I think we could, we should put more at the center of our political debate what we might do to reconsider that, and whether we really want the, the speculative reaches of finance to dominate the economy, the productive part of the economy, to the extent uh, that it has in the last few decades. Yeah, during COVID, I, when I couldn't sleep, I would watch two movies over and over again, one called Margin Call and one called The Big Short. Oh, yeah. I used to work at the Wall Street Journal editorial page, but they turned me into a Marxist. <laughs> That's <laughs> some of the things they describe about the financial crisis. Let me ask you uh, about the economy and character in a different way. Uh, you mentioned Thomas Jefferson. He famously thought the character of the country was, was built on the, the lifestyle of a farmer, the, the yeoman farmer. And he was opposed by my hero, Alexander Hamilton, who also thought the industrial economy was not only gonna make us rich, but would improve our character, would invigorate us, it would create drive and ambition and, and dynamism and allow poor immigrant kids like him to rise and succeed. We now are living in a, a service economy primarily, 
Yeah. And how do we think about the jobs we do and the effect that it has on us for most of us who are in this service economy? I think we should, in thinking about the service economy and the gig economy especially, we should at least remind ourselves of the questions that for Jefferson and Hamilton were central to economic debate, which is the question that we've been discussing. What, what are the formative effects of this or that way of organizing the economy? And I think part of the, uh, the problem of work in a service economy and in a gig economy is that the forms of work that are available are not of a kind that cultivate what Jefferson prized, which is the kind of independence of mind and judgment that democratic citizenship requires. Part of the problem with the gig economy is, I mean, Jefferson worried about being under the thumb of a boss and being dependent but in the case of the gig economy, uh, the boss is is abstract. It's really an, an algorithm. And that's, uh, I think Jefferson would be appalled at the formative implications of, of a gig economy, which uh, elevate the dependence he feared among working people. To, to a level, thanks to the algorithmic assignment of tasks, uh, to an an unimaginable degree. I think we have to ask more broadly what it would take to renew the dignity of work. I think that we should, we should focus less on arming people for meritocratic competition, because as you pointed out before, that's really a project for the top 20%, who gets into what school and what it takes, what should be the admissions criteria. But most people, most Americans, we easily forget this, most Americans do not have a four-year college degree. Over 60% do not. So our economic debates should really be about how to renew the dignity of work, understanding that work isn't only about making a living, it's also about contributing to the common good and winning recognition, honor, and social esteem for doing so. That brings the formative project back into economic debate. Now, the left and the right, Democrats and Republicans, will disagree about the meaning of the dignity of work and how to, how to enact it in practical terms. But at least if we were debating that question, we would be reconnecting with the formative project that we've been discussing and, and asking questions that, that go beyond questions of efficiency uh, and consumer welfare, and that take seriously the connection between uh, our producer identities and citizenship, our sense of civic possibility and responsibility. Yeah. This may be an unfair question because you may not have thought about this much, but maybe you have. Um, what the question is? What do you think about the universal basic income? And I ask that because there is this debate, as a lot of people more on the left, I suppose, uh, think it's a good idea It'll to give people some security. Uh, more on the right, they think you can't give people a benefit unless you tie it to work, uh, and that 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 is part of just the structure of our society, and you'll have enervating effects on them if you do that. What's your view on that? I'm ambivalent about the universal basic income for the following reason. The appeal is that if it can be enacted without devastating essential public services and sources of support, such as public education and healthcare and so on, it can be a way of strengthening the hand of workers and labor and decommodifying work to some extent. And that's a good thing. However, here, the reason for my ambivalence is many supporters of the universal basic income are Silicon Valley entrepreneurs who are inventing robots and AI, forms of automation, that they hope and expect 
will render much work obsolete, at least the work of a great many people, uh, lower skilled and middle skilled workers, and that the universal basic income will be a way of placating them, of buying them off in effect, and saying, all right, here's, here's some money, go away, and don't, don't obstruct our version of innovation, the march of technology. I think that's a dangerous and pernicious uh, impulse first, because I think the direction of technology should not be decided by, by venture capitalists or Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. I think it should be the subject of democratic deliberation and debate. What sorts of technologies will serve the common good and what may what, what ones should be discouraged? That's number one. Number two, I think a world without work, if that's the scenario of the universal basic income, a world without work for large swaths of the population would be a world in which a great many citizens are not enabled to contribute to the economy and to the common good and to win the social recognition and honor that is connected with contributing to the common good. Another way of putting it is, it celebrates our consumer identities at the expense of our producer identities. And in the long history of the civic tradition, citizenship has always been most closely connected to our identity as producers and our ability to feel pride in the contributions that we make, whether or not those contributions involve a job that requires a university degree. So if a universal basic income is meant to ease the way, to anesthetize uh, working people, to buy off complaints about a world without work for a great many of us, I, th I think it would undercut the element of contribution and participation and recognition that is necessary for a healthy civic democratic life. Yeah, well, I certainly agree with that. I, if you took work away from me it, this week during the World Cup, I've been a little <laughs> frustrated that I have to do a job and not just watch soccer all day. But, um, but in general, uh, my life would be would fall to pieces very quickly. Uh, let me ask you a, a question related to that. When you were talking about the tech people who are bringing AI and robotics into the workforce. You've also, I was reminded, written a book about genetic enhancements. Yeah. Uh, and these, both these things seem to be ineluctable forces of progress before which an ethicist really has no chance <laughs> uh, to stop them. Now, what, so that you've been in this game a long time. What's your view <laughs> of whether an ethicist or ethical thinking can say, well, we can do that, but let's not do that? Well, in the case of using new genetic technologies to not just to cure disease and repair injury, but to um, make us smarter, to enhance our cognitive ability or to, to support performance enhancements, speaking of the, the Olympics, to make us better than well, I think non-medical uses of technology um, are, are morally suspect. Um, but there's a, there's a, now you may say, but this is the direction of technology and there is a market for any technology that will make us stronger or smarter or more handsome and beautiful. And it's, it's whistling in the wind to moralize about, uh, what's lost to our, to our humanity. I don't, um, I, I don't accept that counsel of, of helplessness and despair for the following reason, David. And this also applies to forms of technology and robotics and AI that would make work obsolete for a great many people. I think there is a certain picture of technology that says technology develops on its own. It's like a fact of nature. It's like the weather. And the only question for politics is how to adapt. And in many ways, this view of technology 
and also this view of uh, the market economy was a view that mainstream parties, Democrats, and Republicans alike bought into from the 80s to really to 2016, that the only political question is how to adapt to the to global capitalism and its inevitable direction and to technology and its inevitable direction. But I think that what we've seen, the disruption that we've seen to say nothing of the backlash politically over the, uh, well, since 2016 suggests otherwise. I think one of the greatest uh, uh, misjudgments and even hubris of those uh, of that council was to accustom us to think that we cannot direct or hope to direct um, or steer uh, innovation and technology. I think we should put back on the political agenda the question of what forms of technology will enhance the common good and what forms will be inimical to it. And to take one small example, we just assume that modern technologies will lead to automation and getting rid of work. But technology could take a different direction. It could enhance work rather than uh, abolish work. But whether it does the one or the other, making workers more productive or making workers redundant, that's not given in the stars or in some technologically determinist way. That can be up to us, but only if we put that question on the political agenda and debate it as democratic citizens. Yeah, I'm with you. I go back to the predictions people made 70 years ago that we'd be so rich, we'd all be working 14 hour work weeks or 10 hour work weeks. And the opposite has, has happened. People, when they get one interesting thing is now these days, unlike most other times in human history, rich people work more hours a week than less rich people. And so if you can have a job you enjoy, people tend to want to dive into it. Let me go uh, to questions uh, from the group on the chat and feel free to add more. Uh, so one, one question is, what most worries you about the current state of American democracy? What about opportunities? What can we do when this all cont continually feels so bleak? When can we be hopeful when it all feels so bleak? What worries me most about American politics and American democracy today is that, well, uh, let's go immediately to the political moment. A great many people heaved a sigh of relief after the midterm elections. It seemed that the specter of the return of Donald Trump was somewhat lessened. So people heaved a sigh of relief, but whether that's right or wrong to believe that uh, to shape expectations about what will happen two years from now, I think it's a mistake, especially for those who worry about the future of democracy, to be so fixated on what cable news gins us up to think about, which is you know, Donald Trump's latest statement or outrage. Because that is distracting us from a larger necessary project of asking, how did the mainstream parties, how did progressives contribute to the conditions? And by this, I mean the rising inequality, the bailout we talked about, contribute to the conditions that led to such grievance and resentment that the public was willing, great many people at least, were willing to vote for Donald Trump. I think there, has to be, there hasn't yet been the kind of critical reflection and examination uh, among those who worry about the future of democracy, about our role or the role of our respective parties in having laid the way for, paved the way for the anger and resentment that 
led to the polarization we see today. And I'm trying through this book and also through the tyranny of merit to invite progressives, but also mainstream adherents of either mainstream party who worry about democracy and polarization and anger and resentment and backlash, who worry about those things, not to become so absorbed in the latest outrage reported on Gable television, that we don't ask ourselves hard questions about how we should we should find our way to a politics that it takes these grievances seriously. Okay. Before I go to the next question, I'm going to give a heads up to our host, Ellie, that your brilliant moderator, uh, prestigious New York Times columnist, David Brooks, forgot to plug in his computer. And so I'm down to about 8%. So if I disappear, I'm going to ask Ellie to ask the rest of the questions. <laughs> I think I'm going to make it. But Excellent. We'll <laughs> Uh, so one of the questions is, at the start, you said that uh, most economic discussion is limited to distribution of um, the, the spoils, yet inequality is one of the most uh, substantial issues that we're wrestling with. How can this be addressed to support our democratic system? We've not seriously addressed inequality, despite the fact that it's been widening quite dramatically over the past four decades. To the extent that we have responded to inequality, and by we, that we, we've seen mainstream parties do so, it's by offering individual upward mobility through higher education. It's been politicians saying, going back to, uh, to the Reagan years, but also Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, saying, if you want to compete and win in the global economy, Go get a college degree. What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. This is an inadequate response to inequality and to wage stagnation. Because it, instead of asking, how should we change the structural conditions of the economy that have left out so many uh, working people? It's essentially saying to working people, Improve yourself, and if you don't, it's your fault. It's no wonder that many working people turned against elites and mainstream parties. So I think we need to address the sources of the inequality, reconfigure the economy to address the inequality, rather than simply saying that mobility is an adequate answer to inequality. It's not so easy to rise in this economy, and it turns out that despite what we've told ourselves for a very long time, we don't have to worry about inequality because you can always rise from the condition of your birth. It's harder to rise under conditions of inequality. Mobility itself is not an adequate answer. So I think we need to take it on directly. Uh, so that sounds like you're talking about reasonably systemic structural changes. And yes, how do you do that without, well, from my perspective, falling into a sort of a de regist stagnation <laughs> where capital is not free and labor is not free to, to go where productivity wants it to go? Well, we need to, the, whether capital is free to go where productivity wants it to go, goes back, David, to the discussion we were having about, uh, about finance and about the distinction between productive finance and speculative finance and the imbalance that's arisen between the two. And about what you, how you almost became a Marxist when you were on the Wall Street Journal editorial board. So I think that if that's right, then there's a lot of room for uh, debating ways of reconfiguring the economy and the role of finance and the way the tax system rewards certain activities rather than others without lapsing into a Dirichis state. Let me give you one quick example, and it's related to steering technology. Today, if a company has a choice between hiring more workers and buying a machine or a robot, the tax system provides a tremendous incentive to hire a machine because the uh, overall taxes to be paid on the worker under our current system amount to about 25% of the pay of that worker. The taxes on that machine 
amount to about 5%. So we have already built in to the uh, treatment, uh, the, the payroll tax and to the depreciation, capital depreciation and tax on capital gains, we already have built in uh, large distortions of what, what you call what productivity wants or what efficiency would require. So I think there's lots of scope to debate ways of contending with inequality that simply involve questioning the, the, the values embedded in the tax policies and the regulatory policies that we already have. Yeah. Now, Susan Orkin has an interesting comment that progressives have contributed to the current situation uh, and wants to know how, how they, what the approach, what the debate should be. And, and that brings to mind something you've said these last two books are an attempt to get progressives, uh, among others, to saying, how are you responsible? And I'll just give you one quick experience I had about a year ago, I suppose, I wrote a piece for The Atlantic called How the Bobos Broke America, which was about um, how the upper middle class has contributed. And I cited you and I cited another prominent book on the meritocracy, The Meritocracy Trap. Um, and I really hammered home, basically, the Atlantic's readership on how we were responsible. And the response I got was acceptance of the critique, embrace of the critique, and then let's move on. <laughs> and I don't know if that's been your your reaction, that people are not averse to talking about the problems of the meritocracy. I think that people really like to talk about it, but it's like uh, the, the idea that that should lead to change, uh, it, it, that's where people begin to like, oh, I don't know about that. I mean, yeah. Harvard, you, know, you don't want to stop being Harvard. <laughs> well, I, I think this is, this is one of the great challenges uh, David, I, th I think progressives should begin by noticing a simple but quite stunning fact, which is that today, uh, people without a four-year degree vote for the right, for Trump or for conservatives. And people with four-year degrees and especially advanced degrees vote for center-left parties, in the case of the United States, the Democratic Party. What's striking is that this, uh, this is a reversal of the traditional pattern. Back in the days of FDR, the Democratic Party won the votes of working people and people without a degree. And the Republicans uh, predominated among people with college degrees. They were the affluent. They voted for Republicans. That flipped uh, in the 2000s not only in the United States, but also in Britain and in France and in other and democracies. And it's worth asking, it's progressives should ask, first, how did that happen? That progressives or the Democratic Party or center-left parties lost credibility with working people. How did that happen? And does that have something to do with our response to inequality and to wage stagnation and the financial crisis? and the market triumphalism of free trade agreements and all, all the rest of it. And I think that question is a question should, uh, the progressives uh, need to ask. How, here's another way of putting it in a phrase, how is it that we, speaking of progressives, are implicated in having created a society deeply divided between winners and losers? And why is it? that the winners tend to vote for the Democratic Party and the so-called losers of globalization now are drawn not only to, the, to conservative parties, but to right-wing authoritarian populist parties and politicians. Yes, I try to prick progressive consciousness with this question, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's amazing how the parties have switched constituencies yeah. more or less. Um, we are at seven o'clock right now, so we are at our time. My laptop battery is drained, but my mind is full. <laughs> so <laughs> I thank you uh, for a uh, scintillating hour. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. And Ellie is back maybe to send us off into the night. Thank yeah. you so much, David. Sure, pleasure. Thank you both, David. I'm glad we, we got you the full hour. Um, 
just thank you both so much. We could, you know, this could go on and on, but we're, we're so grateful to have had you for 60 nice full minutes. Um, everyone on this call will be receiving a copy of the book. Um, so much more to delve into there. And thank you both so much. I hope everyone has a lovely night. We'll talk thank soon. Thank you.